This is the Aftermarket Radio Network. You know, there's nothing better, nothing better than catching up with an industry friend at TST's big event. Dive into the blueprint of Kevin Eckler's second location and his transparency of learning a valuable lesson of full commitment with his employees. He explains words are just words until actions are put into place. You'll also hear from his newest employee that was an intern at his shop. Great wise words from Kevin. And thanks to our partners, Apex and Shopware, for providing you this episode. You know, how many tabs right now, how many tabs do you have open on your screen right now? Come on, be honest. Shopware's all-in-one shop management platform provides a direct integration to more than 3,000 business and marketing tools so you can focus on your day. On the web, talk to my friends at Get. Shopware.com. You know, Apex knows the importance of the service professional and last year created a dedicated space, Repair Shop HQ. This area is a one-stop shop for all your service and repair needs, including technical and management classes taught by the industry's most sought-after trainers. Registration is open right now. Visit aapexshow.com slash register. And remember, make your hotel reservation. Hey, warm welcome to my friend, Kevin Eckler. Good afternoon, Carm. Hey, man. Uh, foreign car specialists in Poughkeepsie, New York. Now, you can say Poughkeepsie, but don't ever try to write it or spell it because you'll fail the first, third, fourth time, right? Oh, yeah. It's, uh, it's quirky. <laughs> yeah, I know. I have to spell check Poughkeepsie. Glad you're here. We're at the big event. Thanks so much to G. Trulia for providing us the coat room to set up our temporary nice. studio. Isn't this very nice, huh? Cozy. I may walk away with one of those fur coats that are sitting Ooh. over there. <laughs> Kevin and I were kind of doing a little um, uh, messenger. Uh, this past week, and I said, uh, I know you're going to the big event. you got to get some of this stuff off your chest. Come on in. Let's do an episode. <laughs> Always fun to do this. A lot of really cool and neat things that are going on in Kevin's world and in Kevin's life. And, you know, one of them is, uh, you know, he's so humble, it's tough for him to accept a compliment from someone. And I'm sure a million people are like that out there. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and what he does for his advisory boards. Uh, and I think you said, God, if it wasn't for you getting on your soapbox, Carm. Yeah. If you had not talked about this so frequently, I wouldn't have, first, I've realized even the opportunity existed. I had no idea that the general population could have input on the education that their kids were getting. I thought that was all locked up by a school board. You talked about it. We looked into it. Our local BOCES, which is New York's technical high schools, we joined the advisory board. I have gone in and done guest speaking for the automotive program for the daytime for the kids. Through time, I actually have this past semester become the adult education instructor for the evening classes. Oh, how cool. So it's progressed through all the steps, and now I went from be kind of curious about it to very deeply involved. So uh, I'm I'm so happy to hear that. Every time people say something and it triggers something in me, so let me get something off my chest. Local uh, independent group in Buffalo uh, had our uh, breakfast meeting. It's, It's once a month, and we asked the chairman of the college, uh, mm-hmm. Automotive Tech uh, to come in. I'm on that advisory board. Nice. A couple of us are, and, and he came. And uh, we, we basically looked at him and said, what is it that we can do for you? Perfect. And you know what he said? I need teachers. I need part-time teachers. And he looked around the room at all these shop owners. He says, I know every one of you here were techs, and now you own a shop, and I know you're still in it. I know you're still all ASE certification. Why don't you pick up one night? Come on and teach That'll get you close to the students. That'll give you a name inside of our college. Absolutely. And you did it at the high school level. Yeah. I went in and talked to the kids in high school, but then they also offer an evening program for adults. It's different because the high school program, the kids just kind of show up. It's an option compared to going to regular high school. So the adults actually pay a reasonable amount of money to take this class. And so it's adult ed? It's adult ed. It ranged from people that were 18 to, I think, 58 was my oldest student. What do they want to learn? Everything. The engagement and involvement and the quest for knowledge from them, uh, there were guys and gals in there. It was a mixed group of people, and every one of them was really, really interested in getting involved, learning how things work. Maybe out of the whole group, there are two that may not pursue an automotive thing, like it might quite not be for them as they were figuring it out, but the rest of them, they've got a really great chance. If they decide to apply themselves, they could do incredible with this. Are they coming in there to learn DIY or just to respect the vehicle? I think a couple of them came in to learn how to fix their own cars because a lot of the questions were initially, well, how do I do this test? How do I fix that? How do I understand that? My dad was a super positive person. 
I learned from him that what you breathe into somebody is what they can become. And it's exciting and fun for me to show these people that, and I can't call them kids because they're adults. I show these people what they're capable of. And this is a tiny percentage of what you're actually capable of. So we started taking things apart and figuring things out. And they realized that they could do things, create positive results, and they actually worked. Uh, they'd bring their vehicles in, they'd have something, and I'd look at it like, okay, what's this part? relative to what we learned, what I taught them, what I showed them in videos or in screens or in books. Like, here's the real part. Show me what it does. Show me how it works with this. Okay, this one's not working right. What are we going to do to fix it? What do you propose the solutions are? Are you having any fun? I am having a blast. Cool. Good for you. Are you having a blast trying to grow your company? I am so excited about that stuff. So that's, that's part of the fun. Passion is contagious. I go in there with the kids adults and they're getting really excited about what I'm showing them and then I think about the total potential of the facility that we've acquired and what we're going to do and not just doing repairs but the opportunity to take and teach and educate people through that so I'll throw everybody an old name Montgomery Ward (sighs) whoa and you bought an old Montgomery Ward facility yeah an old auto center you're working with government and architects and plans to turn this into a state-of-the-art facility with a training center. Absolutely. How cool is that? Yeah, it's fantastic. First time I walked in the building, the the showroom area, it's 30 by 80 in the showroom. I'm like, what a waste of space. What am I going to do with this? You could put a pool in there. I probably could. Swim laps. We could compete with the Y. It'd be a blast. Maybe we'd do bowling or shuffleboard later. Who knows? And then we very shortly realized, because Lisa and I go to training events all over the place, and I'm like, this would be perfect to bring in subject experts. And, you know, just like the events that we go to, we could bring people in that could just better our whole community. Niche training, uh, if you will, I always called it boutique a while back. You've got the facility. You can bring in the vehicle. It could be hands-on. It could be lecture. You yeah. bring in a particular trainer to come in. To, to do a Friday, Saturday, whatever you want to do, yeah. times doesn't matter. Trainers are willing to come in and do something focused and specific for you. Here's the price. You mm-hmm. divide it by the number of guys who want to bring their peoples over. For sure. And for very little money, if mm-hmm. everybody splits the cost, you've catapulted your training. Yeah. And do you think of the opportunities? Places we've been, it's either classrooms or it's in a a great shop that has a small office area where you can't really do all the educational stuff. So we've got the opportunities if they want to do demo things, we can set stuff up in the workshop where they can train up in the front in the training area, then we can do hands-on things. Uh, We try to coordinate the whole thing so it just flows really quickly. And uh, one of the things that I learned very, very fast, uh, one of them probably will be one of the most important things in the shop is multiple bathrooms. Never thought I'd be working on designing so many bathrooms. <laughs> because of your training. Because of the experience in going to training events. I yeah. realized that, okay, we're doing this, we're learning, great, there's a break. And everybody in class usually all has to use the facilities right about the same time. I see. There's a 10-minute break, and mm-hmm. it's a 15-minute uh, pee line. <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah, the quickest way to lose somebody's attention is to lock them all up from being able to get in the bathroom. Yeah, I know. That's cool. Mm-hmm. So how many bays is it going to be? There are 12 bays in the shop. How many do you have now? There are currently eight bays in our shop, which has, In your current shop. In our current yeah, shop, yeah. which has six different additions, so the structural walls are in horrible places, and it used to be a body shop, so yeah. the ceiling height doesn't matter for a body so, shop. So you're trying to overcome all the things that the current shop doesn't have. So we've been struggling with 19 parking spots for a long, long time, and everyone's like, when are you going to get better parking? And there's a state park right next to us in a, a very healthy, growing neighborhood. There is no more parking to be attained. We've got 56 spots at the new place, and I'm so excited. So your second shop, how far away from the current? Just over seven miles, so it's not a huge distance. But it's still in the city of Poughkeepsie? Yeah, Poughkeepsie's weird. There's a city, and then there's a town, both of the same name. So we're right in the middle of the city, and this is right on the edge of the town. Right on the edge of the town. What are you going to do that you've always wanted to do in that building? Now, besides the training center, I get Mm -hmm. that, but what else? I think, and maybe this is a wrong perspective, but starting with a completely clean slate. You ever start on a project in an area, like working on a room in your house, and you're you're living in that environment, you never quite fully achieve everything that you want to because you have to live, work, breathe in, in that environment. So having a completely blank palette that we can do what we want to. So rather than trying to adapt and fit everything that's in the element 
to be the best it could be for us. It gives us a chance to say, we've got doors and walls. And how can we maximize this to be the best possible situation to serve people as if absolutely I know best you, as possible? You're going to take this to the deepest depths of your thought, and oh, then yeah. you're going to have to back it up and accept something more high level, right? Lisa has reined me in a bunch of different times. <laughs> I was right. The squirrels are running wild. <laughs> I wake up in the middle of the night with crazy ideas. We're driving down the road. I'll just blurt something out. She's like, what's that? Where's that pad of paper I had on the nightstand? I got to write this down. I can't sleep. Yeah, where did that come from? We'd be talking about something else, and something would run through my mind. I'd get all excited about it and blurt it out like I'm five. I wish you all kinds of luck. You belong to a coaching group. You're, mm-hmm. you're, you're heavily networked in our industry. Take me back to the day that you said to Lisa... We're going to grow, and we, we're going to start looking. Big decision. Was she behind you 100%? Uh, completely. When she joined us at the shop, it very, very quickly became apparent that the building and the business and everything was just overwhelmed. We had grown beyond what the building was capable of. If all of my guys parked on the lot, there'd be room for two customer cars. So how do you grow the staff when you can't even park yeah. people in the area? When it snows... We're on a snow emergency route, so we're scrambling to find places to park. Carm here. You know, the number one reason shop owners attend Apex is to see the very latest new products and technologies. In my opinion, a close second is the opportunity to meet face-to-face with people to discuss issues and new opportunities. Hey, let's not forget how much fun it is to get together with friends in the industry, both old and new. Apex is the one place to see all people, products, services, and technology that affect your business and your profits. Plus, you'll get to participate in the industry's best training while you're there. And don't forget the service professional-focused section, Repair Shop HQ. Within this dedicated space, Joe's Garage brings the feel of a working shop to your Apex experience. Besides top training, you'll be in working bays and experiencing new tools, technology, and equipment firsthand. Mark your calendar now to attend Apex 2022, November 1st through the 3rd in Las Vegas. Keep in touch at aapexshow.com. Now, housing is already open and registration will open May 2nd. Visit aapexshow.com. As much as you love the shop routine you have now, I'll tell you that switching to a cloud-based shop management system will pay off in more ways than you can imagine. Not only will you let go of bad habits that cost you money, you'll free up more time for your techs to fix more cars. Your quotes will be quicker and more accurate, and you'll make more money per part than you ever did before. Hey, we all know time is money, and when you streamline your day, you waste less time on repetitive brain drains. Start fresh by going to your favorite browser and looking up GetShopware.com, and the orange Book a Demo button will set you on a journey for more profit and less stress. You'll never look back on the web at GetShopware.com. Listen, Kevin has been such a great contributor to the show uh, if if you want to hear more about this guy and Lisa yeah you and Lisa and Lisa you know getting married and all this stuff I mean Kevin has really shared a, a big portion of his life story with us and you probably can't find it as you're scrolling up in your player so go to the website remarkableresults.biz type in Kevin Eckler E C K L E R and there's a whole bunch if you like what you hear you can keep listening to more so Kev, there was a uh, a young man, I'm going to call him a young man because I'm mm-hmm. an old man. Well, not really that old. He came up to us at Vision and said, hi, I'm Matt Wagg, and I listened to your show. And he started to tell me stories about mm-hmm. how what he heard on the podcast and the people that he listened to helped motivate him. Yeah. And uh, I hear that so much. I'm hu- always humbled by hearing these stories and to meet the people that are on the other end of what I do. We had him in our live cast, and so we're starting to do stuff with Matt because I really, really like him. We're going to do an aftermarket weekly with Matt Wagg. I actually pre-recorded his shop tour last week before I came here, and he is wonderful. His shop is amazing. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. You and I were, again, going back and forth on Messenger, and and Matt Wagg Mm -hmm. is also a fan of yours. Yeah, which... 
me not receiving stuff well was kind of awkward for me. He had he had reached out and said, "Hey, I, I heard you on Carmen. I really appreciate what you had to say." And I, you know, what else do you say? But thank you, I appreciate that. And you're, I get all awkward. And maybe this is an important thing to talk about. We work hard in everything that we mm-hmm. do. Ten hours a day building a business, and every once in a while, somebody comes up and says, "Wow, this is this is great." And yeah, yeah. And then we, we make these excuses as to why it's not great. Well, we work hard here. And as we were talking off off microphone, mm-hmm. one of the things, two things I learned in, in life, the hard way, by the way, Kev, is to say, I don't know, and to be gracious and say, thank you. Yeah. And just let it sink in for a moment. Don't let it blow up your ego. Mm-hmm. Don't let it get you upset to say, wow, what does, I can't believe this guy looks at me. And, and Matt Wag looked up to you. I mean, he, he heard your rawness of your story and, yeah. and, I, and it motivated him. Yeah, I think we connected on certain ways. What I said was relatable to him. And we started going back and forth on Messenger. And I had, Matt used to be an instructor for Caterpillar. And he'd sent me some pictures of the different engines and the different things I, that he'd worked on. I'm like, holy cow, dude, this is incredible. Uh, I look at him as a brilliant man who followed his passion in learning that and then decided that he wanted to pursue into the automotive world and risked everything he had to move forward. Getting to know Matt, we're becoming friends and we're talking back and forth. And he's telling me that that I encourage him and... and he says he looks up to me, and like I said, I get awkward, and, and it's hard for me to take a compliment. Yeah, I, I know. Um, yeah. I love giving them, but it's hard for me to take that. And I and I look at him, and I go, I'm thinking in my mind, I made 20 years worth of mistakes to get almost as far as you've gotten. And in this incredibly short time, he has made great decisions. He has made wonderful progress, and he has, in my opinion, far surpassed where I've gone uh, because he's applied all the stuff that he's learned. I'm one of those old critical guys that's stuck in my rut, and uh, I'll be like, okay, yeah, that sounds really good, but I don't think it's going to work for me. <laughs> he has a coach very young in his business career, mm-hmm. who, uh, and I know him, and he wouldn't he, he wouldn't be easy on him. Mm-hmm. He would probably be tough on him, and Matt probably needed the toughness. We if, need that. If, if he was going to survive. Every coach sees incredible potential in every client. Yeah. If the client's willing to play that accountability game with the coach, Matt... I don't believe had a choice. I mean, I'm not saying that he did or didn't have a choice, but his choice was to say, yes, sir, I'll have another. Yeah. It's a quote from Animal House, I think. (laughs) Realistically, no one can listen to your podcast over and over again and say, yeah, I don't need that. Yeah, I, uh, I don't Carm need a coach. Is, I can do it on my own. Yeah, how could Carm get on every week with all these shows, build this aftermarket radio network, woof the same stuff all the time, all this phony junk that everybody says they're supposed to do? Mm-hmm. Uh, well, well, I'll tell you that when I started, I classified that the, there was 10% of our industry that were top shops. And today, mm-hmm. 20%. And you know what? I've run that number by coaches privately. I said, here's my think. I don't have statistics to prove it. Mm-hmm. And I said, I think that the top shops have grown over the last five years to about 20% of the industry. And every single coach I've ever approached, they said, we wouldn't argue with that number. So it's not about my podcast. It's about the fact that people are sick and tired of having a hobby, making a little bit of money, realizing mm-hmm. if they want to be here in the future, they have to fix. They have to change. They have to yeah. worry about sales mm-hmm. and margins and costs and labor rates and human resource and paying people well and training. And mm-hmm. I'll stop there. Years ago, when I first started out, I looked at everybody else's competition. Um, I've got to survive and I've got all these shops around me and you know you don't talk bad about people because I was raised differently than that but I don't look at them like you know I'm going to do what I can to survive and good luck to you and the more that I have learned and grown through my career and I realize that there's far more work than any of us could all ever do and we need to really all support and strengthen each other. You're not my competition if you're a separate shop. We're on the same team. Yeah. I need to strengthen you. Yeah. If I help you educate and grow and teach you the things that I've learned and show you the value in that, you'll get better and you can pay your guys better. And we'll all earn a better living. We'll all work in better environments. And I think that it's grown in percentages because now we're not afraid to share with each yeah. other. Yeah. 
here's how I overcame all of these obstacles. Here's the failures that I made. Please don't make them. Take this, learn, and do better and just run with it. Why do shop owners that hesitate or, you know, talk to the hand because the, you know, the face ain't listening thing. When you say there is enough business for all of us, why, why? We shouldn't be fighting. We shouldn't be hurting each other. Not at all. They don't understand that there's enough business for everyone. I think it's an old mentality. When I first started in this, there was such limited resources. I didn't look outside of stuff. I just thought it was me and whatever information I could gain, whatever knowledge I had. As simple as the internet, Facebook, all the different groups, we're all connected somewhere, somehow on different social networks. And I think finding people is a lot easier and staying connected with people is a lot easier. Realistically, you look at how many people drive, you look at the number of vehicles on the road and then the capacity of your individual shop and you add up the number of all the cars you service each year. And it could be 5,000, 8,000, it could be 300, it could be times all the vehicles you see out on the road. (laughs) You could never... Yeah. In your wildest dream, fit that yeah. capacity. Yeah. You're right. Figure out the car park, uh, how many c- cars are registered within your marketing zone, and you'll gag knowing that when you mm-hmm. look at your car count, or at least the similar customers that come in all the time, mm-hmm. the, the opportunity is in the deferred work. I mean, so much of it's there, right? Yeah. So the opportunity is in doing good, honest strong digital vehicle inspections and and making sure the customer knows what's going on with their vehicle soup to nuts that builds strong relationships trust Mm -hmm. integrity in the company Uh, you know it's like so much business is just there it's already built in yeah People are looking for someone to trust. They're actively seeking someone that will listen to them and understand them. If you just take a moment to simply listen and understand, be their vehicle's advocate. Because most people get in, they turn the key, they drive, they really don't understand and they don't know. Kind of like this morning in one of the classes he talked about. One of the gentlemen let someone borrow his car, he got his car back, he's like, my steering wheel's down. He simply didn't understand that it was a tilting steering column. He didn't understand his vehicle. If if people don't understand some of the simple features and the, the heavier we are with electronics nowadays, do they really know the right ways to take care of their vehicles, all of its needs? So you really need to understand their vehicle and be their advocate for that. I, uh, I got to make a comment on vehicle advocate. <laughs> and Tracy, I think I've said this twice in the last couple of weeks. How do you know that's wrong with your car? And they said, well, I, I Googled it. Mm -hmm. And the answer should be, I'm your Google. There you go. I'm the shop owner. I'm talking to you on the phone. Even if you're a a cold call, I don't know you. Mm -hmm. Well, how do you know that's wrong with your car, ma'am? Well, I Googled it. I says, why don't you let us be your Google? Let Get that car in here. We'll really tell you what's wrong with it. And and that's a metaphor, if you will, Mm -hmm. that you need to rely on us. To help you with safety, reliability for that vehicle, especially with the gas prices are today. And especially, we have the busiest lives we've ever had. We were talking to someone, we were at Apex together, and we snapped mm-hmm. our fingers, and it was like it was just yesterday. Our lives are so crazy, are so we're so busy. We have to bring that vehicle in and just say, just trust us. We're, we're, we're going to keep this thing up and running, Uber, loader cars, whatever it takes to dazzle with incredible customer service. Yeah. It's kind of like people that are Googling their car symptoms, they're like doing a WebMD on their vehicle. Yeah. And how many people, when you have a cold, cough, a scratch, you Google it, WebMD, and then all of a sudden, boom. It's the worst case scenario. You're going to die. you go down a rabbit hole. Mm -hmm. I've got the worst diseases possible. I'm going to die. This is it. This is it. Goodbye, world. Like, that's how it is. And so that's what people are doing. They're kind of web MDing their vehicle. Because they don't know any better. That's a great point, Trace. So so we need to take that from Google is just kind of a blanket general kind of answer. And we need to personalize that for them. So bring it to me and I will personalize that. I will weed out. I'll be your filter that takes all the other garbage out of it. And I'll give you the exact answer. Can I borrow that WebMD idea? I probably already trademarked it prior, so I got to double check on that before you have authorization. She's learned well. I know she has. We have covered a lot of topics, but I want to cover a pretty big one. Uh, you recently losing a tech, and you took the weight of the world on your shoulders about that. 
trust is a super huge issue. Uh, it's, a, it's an important topic. And trust bears many different values in many different world, words. You know, People hear that word and they associate all kinds of different things to it. Trust can be a matter of never lie to somebody. Uh, trust can also be to the other side of it of, okay, I'll take care of that. And then the busyness of the busy day turns into a busy week, turns into a busy month, then other things catch your eyes. And you never take care of that small thing. And then you're going to do something else. And a piece of equipment breaks. And it's not important to you because you don't use it every day. But you know you need to get it done. But I just haven't got it done yet. Or I need to finish this project in the shop. Or I'm going to take care of whatever. Over a period of time, when those small incremental little things don't get taken care of, you know, hey, I know the garbage is tomorrow, but it, I was just too tired to take the garbage out this week. Empty the cans, bring out recycling. Over a while, your guys are going to look at you and go, okay, well, you tell us you've got all these great plans for the future. Prove to me that we're really going to get there, and it's not just really fun to talk about. Because planning a vacation is part of the part of the real fun of the vacation. You get super excited about going somewhere because you're planning it. You're looking at all the activities and everything you're going to do. But my dog gets super excited when I tell her we're going to go out. You want to go for a ride in the car? And she starts getting happy. I'm like, you're going to go for a ride in the car? Where are we going to go? You know, we're, we're off to here, we're off to there. But if I never make it to the door and I never open that door up and we never achieve the destination, she's got no use for the next couple of times. I'm like, hey, you want to go for a ride? She's like, mm, yeah. What's the big deal? Yeah. Yeah, I don't think so because nothing's going to come out of it. So if you tell one of your techs or the group, you know, these are our goals, these are our destinations, but you don't take care of the little details and you don't make those steps. He lost faith and I can't blame him. I look back and I go, I have to own that. We had a conversation. He was thankfully honest in what he had to say and why he had to say it. And I could do nothing but look inside and go, you're right. I didn't take care of this detail. I didn't take care of that detail. I let myself get caught up in this part of life. And not that those are all horrible offenses, but you put them all together in one scenario and, and you, you weigh them all in on the scale. You buy vegetables in the store. You don't buy one pea. You buy a bag of peas that weighs a pound. You throw more and more peas on the scale and eventually the scale tips and you go, okay. So you do a couple of little stupid things and then to the right personalities, those things add up and add up and add up. And that becomes something that irritates them or affects them or causes them to lose confidence. So and you learn from this. Yeah. Yeah. Never say something without fully intending to do it. Make it a priority. I realize that I get caught up in the busyness of the day. Kevin mentioned to me, I got to be busy. So you got the to-do list about doing these other things, but oh, they were they were a, a different kind of busy or a different kind of start. Yeah. And here you're over there. It says, oh, my God. Oh, great. There's a car that's got a diag problem. Let me stick my head under the hood because your joy comes from that kind of busy work. And to be a visionary leader of a business and leader of people, you got to kind of pick yourself off the scruff of your neck and pull yourself up and out. You're not kidding. It just retraining myself. So 40 years worth of I have figured out this complicated problem. I have an immediate reward where I feel accomplishment and measuring yourself as a tech by the work that you produce in that day, the troubles that you figure out, and then associating the same value with, okay, I, I planned this and I talked to that person and I got these numbers done, just wrapping my head around the fact that that, you know, and I know I say it in a different voice in a different kind of way, but the, the work of an owner, the work of a visionary, the work of someone that's leading a business is incredibly important. I need to associate the right value to that so that I prioritize that properly. But you're not an integrator. You're a visionary. Oh, yeah. But you're a visionary who has to stay with busy work. Yeah. And the busy work, in this case of this tech, got you in trouble because you never went back to delegating your responsibilities. Yes. It's not how to do it. It's who does it. See, you're, yeah. you're living in the how. How am I going to do this? How am I going to mm -hmm. get this done? It's a how, 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 me, 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 me. And yeah. you, have to, you have to do more who work. Tracy, come on board, is my who. 
Mm -hmm. And until I read the book, uh, Who Not How, from Dan Sullivan, did it shake my world. I read it about a year or so ago, and Mm -hmm. Barry Barrett sent it to me. And Barry called me up. He says, how's the book going? I says, Tracy's my who. I got to make a strong ploy to get her to come to work for me. And yeah, I did. And she's here. And fantastic. And I think that's part of the lesson here. Once you know what your role is, you yeah. didn't have to fix these things for these guys. No. You felt you did. You owned them. They were on your list. They stayed there perpetually. Yeah. And you never delegated it or you were too happy with your head under the hood to go out and say, this is going to hurt. But I guess I got to go out and figure out who's going to fix this tool or paint this thing or adjust that. And maybe he could have done it for you. The, the person who raises their hand and says, uh, we need to fix this. Can you help us move that along? Instead of Kevin saying, well, mm-hmm. I'll throw sure. that on my shoulders. I'm, I'm Joe Atlas. How many of us from our generation suck it up, buttercup? You know, walk it off. Oh, the, my God, you're yeah, right. You didn't ask for help. That was a sign of weakness. Right. You never asked for help. You took it all on. You proved your manliness or your whatever. Yeah. And I look at the guys I have working for me, and they are an incredible team. They're constantly like, hey, can you help me with this? Hey, can you? And they're back and forth in each other's bays and projects, helping each other with stuff. And I'm, I struggle with asking somebody to open my door. You know, if I'm bringing a car into the shop or helping somebody with something, it, I get out and take care of it myself. And I realize that I'm almost a stumbling block. The old dinosaur that I am from the the, the do-it-myself age and compared to how well these guys work together. So, yeah, the, I'll do it myself. I've almost felt like I just had a moment on the therapy couch here where you're going. That's you. why I'm here. Yeah, no doubt. It was like, oh. The angels are singing. It's like, dude, yeah, I, I need to delegate more. So I've frequently lost track of the vision yeah. because I'm busy. Okay, I, so you're on my couch, and it's mm-hmm. my job to provide you some advice before you leave. <laughs> That's it. I think you just did. We have a nice pillow for Kevin, just so everyone knows. Excellent. I'm nice and comfy. <laughs> so my advice, and again, I'm no professional, but... I'm a friend of yours, so I'm offering it to you out of just the kindness of my heart. And I appreciate that. You cannot take on this second store and do it all yourself. If not, you may have another problem that you didn't least expect because you've got to keep the core together. You've got to build the company. Mm -hmm. You can't make every decision. Hopefully, Lisa's there with you. Yeah. But, you know, this could almost be, you know, team walkthrough, team design, team uh, ideas, it kinds been. of lifts, size of lifts, position of lifts. I mean, yeah. point is, is that their input creates caring and buy-in and all that team culture that mm-hmm. I know you preach, yeah. but you have to show it. Yeah. Your believing needs to have footsteps, footsteps and traction to it. Yeah. It's all just words until actions follow yeah. it. Yeah. Well, good. I, I hope this session was worth it. I will not send you an invoice for this. Oh, um, thank you. <laughs> I would love to talk about an intern that you have. Yes. So uh, can, can I introduce William? Absolutely. William Conus, uh, an intern with you. Uh, how cool is that? I found out that his best friend's family owns the restaurant we were at last night. Yes. Wow, how cool is that? I mean, it's just, stuff just doesn't happen. I mean, you just got to come near New York City and the world opens up to you. But I'm, I'm so proud of you having an intern, Kevin. Yeah, and he's fantastic. I couldn't have asked for better. Uh, are you loving what you're doing, uh, William? Yes, I am. Well, by the way, this is the bonus part of the episode that we have a chance to actually speak to and talk to an intern. We we did an episode, Tracy, I think it was a while back, where we were doing an aftermarket weekly. And the young intern from the high school, the counselor brought the, the intern over while we were doing the show, and we had a chance to interview him. So it was it was cool. And you know how big I am on education, so this is really important. You're in high school? Uh, I was. I'm You're currently was. out. Now, how many hours is he putting in? He- William is now a full-time employee with us. He's okay. He completely through the intern process, and uh, I'm not letting him go anywhere. If you will, he's out of internship, mm-hmm. but but well, like let, an apprenticeship at this point. An apprenticeship. But let's talk about that. Yeah. Where did you find William? I mean, how did William walk into your place? Were you looking because everyone out there, Kevin, and you know that? Mm-hmm. How, where do I where do I find an apprentice? Where do I find an, an intern? It might be right in front of you. Yeah. So growing up. My kids are in the school system. My son was in Boy Scouts. Um, my daughter had friends at school, and I'd go to field days and 
Boy Scout events and hang out and, and just get to know their friends. And William was in my daughter's class. I've seen him since he was young. And watch the way he interacted and behaved with people and such. In your daughter's class? Yeah, he's in my daughter's class. Was your daughter the recruiter? Not necessarily. Okay. I mean, I've gotten to know him through the years, just knowing who he is. And I knew that... So in their senior year, they have to do a certain hours of internship as part of their program and process to okay. graduate. Sure. And just my own assessment, it didn't look like he fit in the cookie cutter mold that he wasn't going to go work in a bank or an office or something. I knew he loved cars. I knew he had a passion for a lot of stuff. So I approached him and I said, hey, would you like to spend your internship at the shop? He seemed like that was kind of okay to him. Do you see a future, William? I do. I just want to add on that. Sure. I think I tried to buy his Firebird a couple of times. <laughs> Did you? No, I didn't. Because? I, I didn't sell it. It was actually a Trans Am. I bought it for my wife. He had an eye on it. Yeah. And he and he figured he, God, well, you, you, I know your daughter. Give me a deal. Chloe came home more than once like, Dad, William's interested in the Trans Am. You interested in selling that? No. I would not sell that. No. How old is it? It's a 78. Oh, wow. Black and black Trans Am with oh. gold bird on the hood. And That's not a smoking Ford. the Bandit car. Oh, yeah. Is it? Oh, baby. And now all my young listeners are saying, Smokey and the Who? What? <laughs> Look it up, Burt Reynolds, uh, Sally Field, uh, mm-hmm. in a classic car chase country western hoot. Mm-hmm. Jackie Gleason. I'm trying to think of, oh my God, oh, I can't believe I'm recalling this. Yeah. <laughs> I can't believe we're recalling this. With a great theme song. Yeah, oh, yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, Jerry, Jerry Reed. Reed. Oh, we said it at the same time. So talk to me about what are you learning? I mean, I've learned a lot, pretty much. I mean, I'm not going to say, you know, I've learned everything. But, right. Oh, I, you've but, got so much yeah, to learn. Yeah, but, exactly. But, you know, when you look back, but, William, I, I, I didn't know this about cars. I didn't know this about vehicles. Well, a big one is uh, oil lights. That's that's resetting the oil light. <laughs> to you, be honest, I'm, I'm, I'm like the guy that... Oh, you mean the service, the yeah, service, service do light? Yeah. Okay. But uh, I'm the guy who everyone goes to, that and TPMS. Wow, wow. So, See? <laughs> See? You, you gave him an important role. Well, it's because us old guys can't remember. There's so many different cars, and I can't keep track of them. He's my go-to for stuff. That's why I'm I like Tracy. How do I do this again? He's like, boom, 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 right through it. I feel kind of silly, but Isn't he's it amazing? really, really good at it. Yeah, whenever we're together, because we don't work in the same office, mm-hmm. but whenever we're together, I say, can you type out that email right away? Because I knew that she could knock it out in 40 seconds where it would take me a minute and 40, right? It is amazing. I'm into technology, mm-hmm. but it's almost like I wasn't into it in my younger years so that my coordination and my mindset is perfect. And I think our youth, if you will, the people that grew up in the, in the digital world, mm-hmm. can navigate that stuff so much quicker, better, and faster. Yeah, he just ad- adopts it ridiculously fast. Yeah. Uh, you guys do DVI? Every car. And I'll bet you that you love that tablet. You can walk right through it. Yeah, I got it down to a good amount of time where I go through everything and document everything. Are you taking pictures? Yeah, lots of pictures. Any video? Lots of video. See, this is all the, those are all the right answers, by the Super way. Super thorough. Yeah. And even though he's not an A-tech, and I hear that most shops are not letting their A-techs do the DVI, but they're training their C or their uh, GS to to do that stuff. Any incentives to if the job gets sold at all? Not necessarily. Okay. I, I don't want to incentivize selling something. I want to incentivize doing an excellent job. I'm with you 100%. And, I, and maybe should, I misinterpreted that. No, 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 you're right. I, we did an episode on uh, an individual giving an ins- the, the reason for the incentive it mm-hmm. needs to be done right a lot of integrity mm-hmm. thorough yeah. and if the service advisor can sell it yep. then the individual is motivated who's doing the DVI yep. to realize their role and responsibility could end up you know in a buck or two or three you know at, at the end of a mm-hmm. you know did my did i give my service advisor enough information to sell the job it, it starts at the root cause mm-hmm. i'm sorry not the root cause but the root of getting that done so i'm, I'm not saying that That's you a, have to or not but yeah and we we pay the guys for the time good so it's not like i expect you to do this for free cool. and uh, and there's no pay or credit for it this automotive world you didn't know a thing about it william you probably never did you ever tinker with your car oh no yeah i knew a bit of it uh i had my motorcycle i was working on that and i had my own car and i was working on that okay it was mostly you know my dad started me with it 
you know, with I, I was helping with his oil changes and stuff. And next thing you know, then I got my own projects, and then you know, I learned from there. Perfect. Bought the books. So you see, watch the YouTube videos. <laughs> every, every, there you go. Everybody says there's nobody out there to to bring on as an intern. There's nobody to bring on as an apprentice. And yes, you connected with your daughter, but. Think of the number of customers out there mm-hmm. that have nieces, nephews, sons, and daughters. Mm-hmm. My sister's cousin's nephew would be perfect for this. You yeah. just got to ask. It's just giving them an opportunity. So that in that adult ed class that I taught, six people asked me if they could come work at the shop. Can I six. come on and can I do an in, do you do internships at your shop? Can you can you teach me more? I want to learn yeah. more. There you go. So perfect. Six people like actively pursued. Not like, oh, it might be kind of fun to... They're very serious. So, yeah, I'd, not so much that there aren't people. We're just not maybe appealing or... or you know, some people you just have to ask. It's kind of like the kid at the school dance that always wanted to dance, and he's just waiting for someone to go, you want to get out there and dance? And then he's going to have the greatest night of his life. This guy has some of the best uh, analogies of life. The Holy dog cow. thing. The dog thing is fabulous. You know, mm-hmm. he, Offer the dog the opportunity to go in the car. Yeah. And then you don't. Then you never open the door. It's disappointing. Completely. Yeah. We don't want to be disappointed. Yeah, I'd rather sit there and not even be made aware of an opportunity than rather than tease me with it and then not produce it. Wow. Thank you so much for being here. A great friend and perfect networker in our industry. Thank you for all that you do in that regard. Any final word? I want to give William a lot more credit than he gave himself with I'm the oil light guy. William has not backed down from one single thing that I've given him. He learns something to where he's comfortable, and then I'll throw him something really weird or something difficult. And early on, he looked at me like, what are you doing? And my response was, I know you can do this. You just need to know that you can do this. He wasn't necessarily comfortable with it before, but I don't think there's much that I can give him right now. And he's looking at fuel trims and running problems and weird quirky stuff and taking engines apart and chasing out wiring. He's invested heavily into what he's doing. Not like, ah, it's your shop and your problem and all. He's into it. And you can tell by looking at his toolbox, which is always clean and always shiny and very organized and full of some really cool stuff that I've seen guys that aren't 20 years invested don't have. He's into it. Did you help him uh, with the tools? I have offered many different times and he is like, no, no. I'll buy my own. Wow. I'm like, no, I'll buy those. He goes, no, 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 I already got them. Wow. If it's mine and I break it, I don't have to worry about it. That's mine. Yeah, so. don't worry about it. Life happens. you, you got to break a tool or two. You do. Sometimes you have to push the limits. How good do you know it tastes otherwise unless you're biting into something? <laughs> exactly right. Kevin Eckler, a foreign car specialist, thank you so much. And uh, William Conus, glad to have you guys both here. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thanks for being on board to listen and learn from the premier automotive aftermarket podcast. Until next time.